This video is sponsored and approved by CuriosityStream. What gives you mass? Now that's a very different question to what gives you weight. Gravity pulling down on your body gives you weight, but your weight can change depending on the gravity. So on Earth, you weigh much more than you do on the moon, where the gravity is a sixth of what it is on the Earth. But you're still made of the same amount of stuff, the same amount of mass. But what is mass? If something is more massive, it's generally harder to move. Think about like people trying to push on a car that's so much more massive. So you can think of mass as a resistance to having motion changed. And that resistance, you know, for everyday objects, you know, we tend to think of it maybe as friction. But what about for smaller and smaller objects? Because, you know, everyday objects around us are made of atoms, which in turn are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons, which in turn are made from even smaller particles called quarks. And on that scale, friction doesn't matter. So what is causing the resistance for those particles? To having their motion changed? Well, that's a question that humans have been puzzling over for millennia. Today, it's the job of particle physicists who literally study the building blocks of nature and their properties. Now, that's not my job. I'm an astrophysicist. I think about the incredibly large things. So I had to go find some experts on this. So a couple of weeks ago, I went to CERN in Geneva in Switzerland to find some particle physicists and talk to them about the history of this question of what is mass and what gives things mass was finally solved. First, through studying the theory of what gives things mass up until the 1960s in the first video in this series, and then a look at the experiments run from the 1960s onwards in places like CERN to try and answer this question of what is mass? So whilst humans have really been contemplating this question of what is everything around us made of, probably ever since we learned to pose questions like that, it really all kicks off in the 19th century, especially with John Dalton's work, who was a chemist who was studying the properties of elements in the periodic table. And he realized that every single element was made of a single unique particle. These were dubbed atoms from the Greek meaning indivisible because at the time it was thought that they were the smallest things that you'd be able to get down to. But that all quickly changed, especially with J.J. Thompson's work in 1897 when he discovered the electron, a tiny particle that had a mass less than any atom measured. And of course, we had the discovery of this invisible radiation by Henry Becquerel in 1896, which eventually would get dubbed radioactivity by Marie and Pierre Curie. They went on to study radioactivity in great, great detail, eventually finding that the particles given off by radioactivity were smaller than the atoms they came from. In 1907, Ernst Rutherford and his famous gold leaf experiment where he shot neutrons at a gold leaf foil to see how many went through and how many were deflected. And he found that an atom is essentially mostly empty space, leading to this model of an atom of a dense nucleus surrounded by this cloud of electrons. That would pave the way in the 1920s and 30s for the rise of quantum mechanics, the study of the incredibly tiny and their properties and how they behave and would really open up a can of worms in physics for this world where nothing is predictable and everything is to do with probabilities. Throughout the 1950s, people also then started building particle accelerators to accelerate these tiny particles up to huge speeds, to collide them together where this bewildering array of particles would spew out that was eventually dubbed the particle zoo. And as particle physicists, you know, really tried to figure out what all these particles were and how they all fitted together in terms of the model of how we built up all of the stuff around us. So yeah, at the end of the 50s, we knew so many more particles than we did at the beginning of the century, 
you know, well more than just electrons, protons, and neutrons. But the question that still hadn't been answered was what gives them all mass? And this was very much the focus for physicists at the turn of the 1960s. Now, the problem was, if you took the equations from quantum mechanics that have been shown to really nicely describe the behavior of, say, hydrogen atoms and other small particles, and if you tried to solve them when things like electrons and neutrons had a mass, all of the equations very quickly got very complex and also were completely inconsistent with each other. They didn't agree at all. They didn't agree with each other. And crucially, they didn't agree with what had been observed either. And people quickly realized that if they set the mass to, of all of these particles to just equal zero in the equations, the equations massively simplified, they all agreed with each other, and they all predicted the correct outcome as well. The kicker obviously is we know particles have mass. We know that there is stuff here and that stuff is pulled on by gravity to give things weight. How do you reconcile what the maths is telling you with what the universe is telling you? So in comes Peter Higgs in 1964 and he said, keep the equations as they are. Keep your mass equal zero and let them all consistently agree with each other. But imagine that the particles are not moving through empty space. They're moving through some different environment. They're moving through an invisible field that permeates all of space, which might sound far-fetched, but think, you know, a magnetic field is an invisible field. And he said it's the movement of those particles through this field that permeates the entirety of space that gives them this drag, this resistance to motion. And it's that resistance, this drag from this invisible field that permeates all of space that we interpret as mass. Now, most of you watching will be thinking that sounds ridiculous and incredibly far-fetched. That's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. And you wouldn't be alone in thinking that because when Peter Higgs first submitted this idea to a physics journal to get it published to the world in 1964, it was rejected for the same reason, that they just thought it was ridiculous. However, Peter Higgs persevered. He did eventually get it published and it caused quite a stir. And the thing was, it sort of ruffled a lot of feathers quite quickly before all those feathers settled back down again and said, actually, that would explain everything. And that's the thing, when a theory comes along that doesn't contradict anything, that doesn't ignore other observations that we've seen and just sort of sweep them under the rug and say, well, you know, this explains things perfectly and I understand it, therefore let's go with it. It actually completely explains the difficulties we'd had with the maths. It completely explained everything we'd observed as well. And so it didn't contradict either the maths or the universe. It brought the two together. And in just a few years, this ridiculous hypothesis that had been rejected by a journal quickly became accepted theory because it was the best theory we had at the time to explain both our maths and what we'd seen very succinctly, despite the fact that we didn't really have any observational proof of this invisible field that permeated the entirety of space that quickly became known as the Higgs field. Now, if you're still struggling with this, never fear, because when I was at CERN, I made sure to ask the particle physicists there what their favorite analogy was for describing the Higgs field. If you're at a party and something like this says, I love this one, you know, you're walking through a crowd of people and if you're not very popular or you're a bit awkward or smell a bit bad, yeah. you know, people are going to avoid you and this crowd could be sort of thought as the Higgs field and you're just going to get out of your way and nobody will stop and talk to you. But if you're very charismatic and talk to everybody, it'll take you a long time to traverse the room. You know, yeah. You'll get stopped every so often to talk to somebody. Yeah. With Aaron's analogy there, you can also consider that the people who move around the room and stop and talk to a lot of people will probably, you know, shake a lot of hands or maybe elbow bump them. And in that process, there'll be this transfer of information from the crowd of people, aka the Higgs field, 
with the person moving around that crowd, aka the particle trying to move through the Higgs field. And that transfer of information is a boson's job, specifically in this case, the Higgs boson. It's the thing that transfers information from the field to an observer or something that's interacting with that field. For example, a photon is a boson, a particle of light. It transfers information about the electromagnetic field to us, the observers. So for example, if you set up a nice simple circuit with a little light bulb and some wires and you would finally attach it to a battery, you're setting up electromagnetic field. Can't see it, but we do see the light bulb come on because photons of light make it to our eyes and exchange information. The funny thing though about the Higgs field and the Higgs boson is that the Higgs field also gives the Higgs boson mass. It's what we call self-interacting and that's always something I struggle with until I met Clara Nellist at CERN and she told me this analogy. The, the best analogy that I've heard for describing the Higgs boson is um... The, the snow field. So it, I haven't heard of this. Have you not heard this? No, one? no, so please tell me. I heard it from John Ellis, who's a, a theorist here at CERN. Um, so he talks about how um, if you have a field of snow, um, the way that you interact with that snow, the, the snow is the Higgs field, mm -hmm. and the way that you interact with the snow is how you interact with the Higgs field. Um, so if, for example, you've got a pair of skis and you're just sliding on top of the snow, then you're either a very light particle or you have no mass at all because you're not really interacting with the snow, you're just sliding on top of it. Uh, if you have snowshoes, then um, you're kind of able to go through the snow. It's a bit easier, so you're having some interaction, but not so much. So that would be maybe like an electron, a light particle. Um, and if you have no snowshoes at all and you're just in some tiny boots, then you're really going to sink in. It's going to be super hard to get through. Uh, the snow field. So that's like a top part that's really heavy. Yeah. Um, and then the Higgs boson itself is is like a snowball. It's like the Higgs field interacting with itself. That's so and cool. That's how you can uh, imagine the boson. So immediately after hearing that analogy, I was like, so Legolas is the photons of the universe because they don't have mass. So they can walk atop the snow. You're completely unimpeded. You know, they're not impeded by the Higgs field, which, okay, it was a silly thought that I had, but it turns out it is something we have to think about and particle physicists are always considering and it, it's sort of a consequence of the Higgs field that people might not have thought of before but I know you'll all care about after my why can't we travel faster than the speed of light video and you all got very engaged in the comments but I'll tell you what I'll let Aaron explain. Depending on how massive a particle is, it depends how heavily you interact with the Higgs field. So something that's very light, a photon, uh, not very light, but zero mass, no mass. Absolutely no mass at all, yeah, that's the lightest you can be, it doesn't see it at all. So that kind of translates to the fact that it's able to go at the speed of light, and that's one of its main properties. Whereas when you start to go up through the mass scale, you start to get more and more interactive with the Higgs. You can imagine it for a photon, it's like traveling in vacuum, for something very heavy, like a top quark, it's like traveling through treacle, you know, then it, it removes that ability for you to just travel at the speed of light. So if you were to turn the Higgs field off, all particles would immediately be massless and adopt light speed, which is quite cool. So I guess, why can't we travel faster than the speed of light? The easiest way to answer it is because we can't turn off the Higgs field. It will always be there impeding our motion and causing this drag and resistance on even the tiniest of particles. I don't know, maybe most of you will enjoy that explanation more than Einstein's way of explaining it. The theory of the Higgs boson really came out of the mathematics in the 1960s. And it wasn't until decades later in 2012 that that was even proven to be right. Even though it was accepted for decades before that. That might sound weird to some, but it's not a rarity in physics. Maths is a tool that we can use and exploit to understand the universe. And you better believe we should listen to it when it's trying to tell us something. It's happened so often in the history of physics. In the 1930s, Carl Schwarzschild used the maths to predict the existence of black holes way before they were ever observationally confirmed in our universe. Paul Dirac in the 30s used the maths of quantum mechanics to predict the existence of antimatter. And even way back in the 20s, Lemaitre used maths to show that the universe was expanding well before Hubble 
ever observed the redshift of Andromeda and a fair few other galaxies in our universe to show that they were indeed moving away from us and the universe was expanding. But making observations is key to turning a mathematical hypothesis into accepted theory. So in the next part of this series of videos, we'll be hearing all about how we actually go about detecting something like the Higgs boson, the experiments that were designed here at CERN to detect it for the announcement in 2012, and what the future holds for our understanding of how everything around us has mass. So before we get to the bloopers, I just want to take a minute to thank today's sponsor, CuriosityStream, who made this whole trip to CERN happen. CuriosityStream is a streaming service with documentaries and non-fiction films on any subject that you can imagine. And the thing is, most streaming services these days, if you sign up to all of them, it's going to be sort of hundreds of dollars a year. Usually CuriosityStream's plan is just $20 a year. However, with their new Stay In and Stay Curious campaign, because let's face it, none of us are going anywhere, we're all under quarantine right now, they have dropped this to just $12 a year. And that way you'd have access to thousands of different documentaries and non-fiction shows that go into so much detail on different topics from physics or even history or arts as well, whatever the thing is that you love. And new documentaries drop each week as well. So there's always new content coming online. Go to curiositystream.com forward slash Dr. Becky, that's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And for my subscribers, enter the promo code Dr. Becky, D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, when prompted during the sign-up process, and your membership is completely free for the first 30 days. Problem is, if you start trying to solve the equations of quantum physics, then... Civics? <laughs> <laughs> but making observations is key. Ow! Higgs, 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 boson! Higgs, 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 boson! Particle physics, particle physics. <laughs> Sorry, I think I've been social distancing for far too long. <laughs> it's only been a week. <laughs>